This is not for you if you need someone to baby you and handhold you along the way in losing weight. This is not for you if you are not 100% motivated to the goal yourself because then I'm going to have to convince you every week to take action. This is not for you if you're an excuse maker. However, if you are dot, 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 dot. So that's how I believe you market and sell with people mm. and for them is you're very upfront about who it's not for. So now you're not needy yeah. and you implement the Harvard effect and how you're going about marketing and sales. <laughs>what's up y'all welcome to the gym owners growth zone podcast i'm your host andres escobar and i'm so ready to share this episode and conversation i had with our guest michael chu michael is a highly successful ceo with a seven figure revenue across his five businesses including champion development inc which offers coaching and support programs to help coaches avoid the burnout and scale their businesses he also shows clients how to turn passion into profits through the maximization model and the LTV method. You can find out more information about him at champdev.com forward slash free. If this is your first time listening to our podcast and you like what you're hearing, go ahead and follow us on your favorite platform. We appreciate your support and are truly thankful for it. Also, when listening to the show and you think of a friend, do them a favor, share it with them because we all know sharing is caring and it's just a nice thing to do around here. My last ask is simple. Since we are new and you all know we need ratings and reviews, we would greatly appreciate it if you leave us your feedback in a form of a review. It would help us reach a wider audience and improve the show for you. By the way, if you have any other comments or feedback, feel free to connect directly with me on Instagram, and I'd love to hear any suggestions or concerns you want to share with me. You can also find me on LinkedIn at Andres Escobar, the number one. Now, as we dive into Michael's episode today, I'm really intrigued to hear your thoughts on what he has to share with us. So let's go ahead and jump into our conversation, and I'll see you in there. Hey everybody, Andres Escobar here, and I want to welcome you to the Growth Zone with Andres Escobar for gym owners. And today we have on the show, Michael Chu. Michael, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, I'm so happy we connected and we finally uh, have somebody that can show our audience a little bit how to go beyond their limits and grow and, and make an impact in this world that can help them uh, become a, a better gym owner. So I want to welcome Michael. Thanks for coming on, and it's great to have you. Yeah, it's my pleasure, and thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Awesome, man. Awesome. And, and just a, a little backstory uh, with the uh, how we connected. Uh, it was just Instagram, and, yeah. and it was me, no, no bot, nothing, no, no AI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and yeah. and it was just um michael's michael's awesome he's one of the most authentic people that i've seen online and sharing his his true story on mm. on his failures his battles his things and i'm like wow this guy i would love to have him on our show and i reached out to him and followed up and we and here he is so i'm, <laughs> I'm so happy to, to bring him on here with for our audience and and michael we love to start out here with what we call the origin story. Yeah. Um, I know a little bit about you. You know, we talked a little bit on on your history and your, your past, on on your success. But could you just give us a synopsis, a, a little brief summary of of who you are and 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 how you got here to this place? Yeah, for sure. Well, awesome. first of all, the reach out is just a a testament to the power of human connection and cold outreach and not being you know, afraid to reach out and, you know, make a connection. So uh, I love that that's how, how we ended up here. Yeah. You, yeah. you mentioned the vulnerability part, Andres, and I want to speak to that as part of, I guess, sharing my, my origin story that you called it. Because I have been um, 
told that plenty of times that, hey, you're really authentic or you're really vulnerable online. And admittedly, being vulnerable, just using that as a, a catchphrase, was not something that I kind of came natural to me uh, for quite some time, especially on social media. I never wanted to be on social media uh, whatsoever. But I, I appreciate you acknowledging that because one of the reasons why I intentionally choose to make sure that's part of my brand and sharing of my full story, both the highs and the lows, is because as part of my origin story, I grew up needing to be an achiever. Like as the oldest son of an Asian family in a small town, uh, I was like, I gotta always be an achiever because I thought that's what made me good enough. I thought that's what made me loved. I got into a great college. Uh, I was a 10 time national karate champion. I started karate when I was three. I was this, that, and the other, that accolade, this, you know, whatever. And I did all the things, even when I got into business, right? I was one of the youngest promotions to an executive role at the first company I was at. I saved 100K by the time I was 23 years old. I bought a house at 24, like all these things, right? And I found myself, Andres, despite all that, still feeling like I would never be good enough feeling like the goalpost was always moving. When I finally achieved something, there was something more I had to go after for me to feel like loved, for me to feel good enough. And that's a really hollow, empty, defeating feeling to become this achiever and this winner on the external side of the world, and yet internally um, feel like I was never gonna be good enough. And so part of the vulnerability part is that I would look at all these other people succeeding and I felt like they were just perfect. I would look at other people's outs like from the outside looking in and I would say to myself, like, there's no way I could be like them. I'm a minority in a uh, town that I grew up in, which was predominantly Caucasian. My grandparents, both sides were poor farmers as part of their upbringing. Almost my entire family, it feels like, are teachers. So I wasn't raised in an environment of entrepreneurship, wealth, and all these things. So I would look at all these people succeeding in business, and I would tell myself I could never be like them. But once I started succeeding, it became important to me to share with others in a relatable way that you don't need to be perfect. In fact, look at all my flaws, look at all my failures, and I'm still able to do A, B, and C. And that's part of why I really appreciate that acknowledgement. And so I guess as the last piece of the origin story, you just heard a little bit of how I got going, um, but that led to now having run and been the, the either the founder, the CEO, or the leader of five different seven-figure organizations at this point. Nice. Um, my current business consulting and coaching company last year was Inc. 5000s, one of Inc. 5000s fastest growing private companies in America, number 548. Um, you know, we, we serve thousands of online coaches, entrepreneurs, et cetera, online. And, you know, I feel really, really blessed with a lot of the things that I have accomplished. But uh, it all started with a boy who thought he wasn't good enough in a small town and all those things. So that's awesome. I mean, the backstory, your, the legacy, the the hard work, you know, you, you mentioned so much, so much information uh, to help us connect with you, and and that's I think what it comes down to, like connections, right? Yeah. The relationships. Yeah. At the end of the day, what do you have? Yeah. Well, yeah, you, oh, you got this, you know, like accolades, like you mentioned. Sure. Great, but what about the connections? Yeah. What are they at, right? And so. I love that you your your mindset your shift happen, and 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 share with the audience how how old are you right? I just actually I just turned thirty nine uh, last week January fifth so whenever we're recording this on what the twelfth so exactly a week ago yeah yeah that's awesome congrats happy birthday Thank you, man. appreciate it. <laughs> yeah appreciate no uh, thirty nine man just about to be forty that is like such and uh, a a point in life you're like wow forty am I where I want to be or there's right. And, and there's, I don't yeah. think you're ever going to be where you want to be. Right. You, yeah. you, that needle always gets moved and, and pushed out. So thanks for sharing that. That's so be That's beautiful. I that honestly yeah, is pleasure. beautiful. Thank you. Um, my pleasure. So I want to, I want to get started with our first question and it has to do with the roller coaster of life. Right. Mm -hmm. And so in life, in business, it, you go up, down, left, yeah. right, fast, yeah. slow, all these different ways. And so there's certain rails and certain tracks that help us keep us in line. Like, for example, I just started the five-minute journal. 
that's like like a, a anchor for me right yeah. in the morning i gotta do it at night gotta do it so what has been for you some focuses that, that some things that help you anchor you and and keep you on track so you you've been able to reach goals in your life in your in the gym business right because you said you you um you have uh your your martial art business that you've you've you yeah. started and stuff so well, as an example that. to the gym owners listening in, so I started karate when I was three. My family owns and operates that uh, fitness center. It's not a gym in the traditional sense, but uh, we run that gym today. Um, I've coached and consulted many brick and mortar, uh, especially MMA style gyms to continue to grow and scale. Um, and so, yeah, so to speak to your actual question, guardrails that have allowed me to create a lot of the life that I have today is first and foremost, buying into that fundamental principle. I remember seeing a LeBron James Instagram caption, Andres, that really, um, I guess, drove home my belief in this concept. And the caption of his Instagram post said, rituals greater than, like the greater than sign, rituals greater than results. And so mm. my takeaway from that- Habits, like habits. Habits and yeah. routines are the more important thing to focus on than the actual result itself. And so early on in my career, right, in my business career, I would get so focused on, I, I, was, I was working at Pizza Hut trying to make beer and gas money. I wasn't making enough money. Uh, and so I got introduced to the first time into entrepreneurship. It was a sales role. And so it was my first time really helping me see that what I learned as an athlete and what I learned as a martial artist resonated into business. And that was that if I focus too heavily on the sales total that I wanted to hit in sales, I rarely would end up hitting it. Instead, if I focused on what I now call the two A's, my attitude and my activity, the routines, if I had the right amount of inputs, I could just more times than not have faith and trust that the outcome or the result would happen. When I looked back, Andres, I was like, that's exactly what I learned in the process of becoming a national champion um, multiple times over in karate. I didn't focus on the trophy. I didn't focus on the competition. I didn't focus really at the end of the day that much on winning. I focused on what? The process day in, day out of becoming the best version of myself, of improving and getting better along uh, the way. So I can go deeper if you want as far as specific routines and rituals that I and how I operate around them now. But to answer your original question, it was just the buy into the fact that routines and rituals are well more important to focus on than just the results themselves. Yeah, I believe that for sure. Right? Fall in love with the journey, not the destination. Sure. Heard that. Yeah, sure. that's, that's huge. Yeah. Could you share with us? I, I love for our audience to take away some tacticals and uh, habits that'd be great like yeah yeah and and, and we'll probably I, I think i have another question for you that will help us dig deeper into that but yeah if you could share one or two that'd be great yeah i'll share two i'll share three quick things cool there's a concept in my health and wealth academy which is my peak performance weight loss and, and yeah it's my peak performance weight loss coaching program for real estate agents direct sales leaders etc and one of the fundamental principles that we teach in that program is called standard over schedule Right? And I believe one of the reasons why so many people are putting in a lot of effort, I ask people all the time, do you feel like you're trying really hard? And many times you're like, yeah, I'm working really hard. And you don't have the result you want still. And they said, yeah, I don't know, I'm not making enough money or I haven't lost the weight, et cetera. And they're like, I don't know. And I'm even following my schedule, they'll say sometimes. But here's the reality. Rarely do we as human beings follow our schedule to a T. And so that's when I realized that the routine and the standard, and to me, I define standards as what we don't tolerate or allow ourselves to go below. And so I got out of shape in my mid twenties, even after having been a, a, a national champion, after having been an athlete, I played baseball and I played basketball, et cetera. So I knew how to be in shape. And here I am making all this money, working 60, 70, 80 hours a week, living in my first business and I got out of shape. Hmm. And I realized that a lot of the things that worked for me at 18 and 20 and 22 were no longer working for me at 25. And I started following my schedules. Like I'm going to just go to the gym, right? Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays. And I still wasn't getting into shape. I still wasn't losing some of the body fat. Well, what was changing? If I missed the gym on Tuesday, 
I'd be like, well, I'll still go on Thursday because that's what's in my schedule. But what would happen is some weeks I'd end up working out twice, some weeks I'd end up working out four times, some weeks I'd end up working out once, some weeks I'd end up working out zero times. And that's not a way to get the result that I wanted. And so that's when I realized that I had to care more about my standard every week, mm. not just the schedule. And no matter what, by the end of every Sunday night, I would make sure that I lifted weights three times a week, no matter what. And Andres being candid, there were times where I would get to Friday and I skipped all of my workouts Monday through Thursday. And I would end up working out then under this new principle, standard over schedule, mm -hmm. I would work out Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Funny enough, when I started committing to a standard, not just a schedule, I started to transform my body even as my business grew as well. So that's an example of how I view routines. Mm. But some that I do myself now is um, I track those standards in a document, like I'm looking down at the document, I track it on, uh, on this document here, and I pick a couple every quarter that I want to be really honed in on for my personal life and my business. So for me right now, I call it five, four, three, two, one. Did I work out five times this week? Did I get 80% of my sleep need four times this week? Did I read or listen to audiobooks three times this week? Did I do marketing for my business two times this week myself? And did I go on a quality date that I was present at one time uh, this week? And so that's a second example of current, present day, how I track my routines. And then lastly, I'll use an actual business example. Julio is one of my clients, he's a fitness coach. Uh, and he has all of the tools to be successful. If anyone's listening in, sometimes we think pure smarts, work ethic, and talent is enough to be successful. And then here we are not getting the revenue, income, or results we want sometimes. And that can be so damn frustrating. It's like, I'm smart, I'm a hard worker, I care, and why do I not have those? What does she have that I don't? Right. If anyone's listening, I don't know if you relate to that. I know I've been there before. Julio felt this way. And in the last 90 days, Julio and I have been really focused on exactly what you're asking about. What routines and what standards does he have to hit? And instead of relying on talent and motivation anymore, he's been focused on one single metric. And that is three outputs for marketing and sales in his business every single day. Hmm. He went from about 10K a month, right, in profit for him to 38K uh, in December. He's trending to 50K right now at the time of this recording for this month already. And all that changed was a commitment to a standard and a routine as a guardrail, you use that word, Andres, mm -hmm. as far as what his activities are in his business. So I know there's a longer, longer winded answer, but hopefully no, that love, clarifies for people. I love that formula. And that's what it comes down to, right? It's like, what is the formula that you need to get to? Because if you're not getting the results that you want, there's got to be a change in that formula. That recipe yeah. is not equating the right yield. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's awesome. And and I had I told you earlier, you know, I had a mindset coach and and yeah, he's like, "Listen, these are the things you got to do. These are the outputs." Um, but, you know, it's a process. Like uh, you said standard over schedule, over schedule right? Yeah. And so so yeah, no, it's so so good. And to um, what you just said as well, the whole like I think people get caught up in strategy or how too much. Tony Robbins mm -hmm. talks about the tyranny of how. We'll mm -hmm. ask, how do you do it? How do you do it? But that's actually like asking what the numbers are to a combination lock, he says, without knowing what order the numbers are supposed to be in or which lock you're even trying to unlock. And so since we're talking to a lot of gym owners here, you would relate to this. That's like being like, what workouts is that person doing? Because he's jacked. But you're not asking how much weight you need to be doing for progressive overload, right? For you to get results or how many reps in what rep range you need to be in. And so you're just trying to replicate the strategy, but you're missing the nuance of standards and so much more detail to what actually leads to results. You said something earlier about um, the attitude. Was it two A's? Attitude and activity. Activity, yeah. Yeah. Love yeah. those two. Love those two. Because if you take the right activity, but with yeah. the wrong attitude, you still might not get results. If you have the right attitude, but you're not putting the right amount of activity, it, if you really boil success down, in my opinion, my humble opinion, at a fundamental level to two things, it's those two things. Yeah. 
Yeah. So so huge attitude. I I drill my kids on the attitude. Attitude's one hundred percent like yeah. the most important thing. <laughs> yeah. And the activity has is right next to it. And I love it. it. It makes less. I love alliteration. So I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that one from you. I Michael. love it. <laughs> t- t- steal with pride. Take it away. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so with these these processes and everything that, that you're doing, there's obviously challenges, right? And so can you recall an obstacle that you've had in your business and how you were able to overcome it? Yeah. I mean, where do I start? Right, right. No, <laughs> they, it's like, oh, uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's a fundamental part, whether you're a veteran business person or brand new or a rookie. Um, anytime I talk to somebody about their goals and their vision and their business plan, you know, one of the questions I always love to ask is what's everything that could go wrong and how will you respond when that happens? You know, one of the, right. one of the second That reminds me of the obstacles, the way the book, the, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but this, the obstacles, no, totally. the way like, think of all the, the gaps and everything that it, it can go wrong. And now, now you, you're ready. If it happened, like if you're in the field, we were talking about the military earlier, if you're in the field, you know, you got to know how to unjam your, your weapon. Cause yeah. If you don't know how to do that, you got to yeah. be able to, you know, control that. So anyway, I was listening to a podcast with Jocko and Huberman mm-hmm. uh, the other day, and they were talking exactly about that analogy. There's tons. I forget what phrase he used because I was never in the military, but he said there's tons of incredible soldiers. And then there was a phrase for it in perfect conditions, like in the training grounds. They're incredible. Right. But the best soldiers, the ones who go on to rank up and all the things, he said they're oftentimes the ones who are not perfect in, um, they're not great in just perfect conditions. They actually shine when in the battlefield, when nothing, when when things are not going perfect. So, I think that's so key to win as a gym owner, to win as a business owner, to win as an entrepreneur. But, mm. I mean, I'll let you choose, Andres, what you think is most relevant. But what comes right off the top of my head is, you know, everything from. Uh, leads slowing down to profit drying up to lawsuits to um, feeling like I was burnt out in a business and like what do I do when I'm not motivated and I'm burnt out and uh, staff turnover right like here I am relying on staff and then they turn over they don't show pissed off clients like I like I said I genuinely could like where do we start that could be its own podcast but yeah what, what you know I'll let you kind of I guess Guide the yeah, way. I mean, I, they're they're also tempting. I I love that. <laughs> I, I I love it because I they're mean, I'm like, yeah, that one, that no, that one, and that one. Um, listen, uh, I mean, you got you got me choosing here. So I I would go with like pissed off clients. Um, just because it it's it's something that that something you can't really control. Yeah, you really can't control that. I mean, hey, lead generation. I I get I get it right. But you can control that. You 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 can put money into it. But pissed off yeah. clients? That's like yeah. you can't. Yeah, it hurts. I mean, it hurts. You you do everything you can. I mean, it's not, you're not in business to piss people off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know. Well, I think it's three things, right? Um, I think an under talked about skill set of being a business owner is emotional control. Right. I actually just saw Alex Ramosi tweet recently. Now that he has. Um, been working with his portfolio company for however long he's been doing that now. The tweet, no, no, sorry, it wasn't a tweet. It was an Instagram reel. And it Mm -hmm. said something along the lines of, he said, the longer I've worked with founders and CEOs and business owners, the more I actually believe that the competitive advantage, and I'm summarizing, this wasn't the exact caption, that the competitive advantage of business owners is emotional resiliency. The ability to address emotions because if the emotions take us off from staying the course now we're not putting in the activity now our attitude is crap and all the things that we just talked about the two a's and so with pissed off clients the three biggest things i've learned uh from that is number one uh, my somatic therapist says if you want to trigger your deepest emotional healing start a business start a family or start a relationship and I think some people end up doing all of them at the same time. That's what I did five (laughs) years ago, right? Six years ago, whatever it was. Um, But yeah, start a business, start a family, start a relationship. And I think people think business is just numbers and KPIs, but the reality is it's human relationships. And so number one to pissed off clients, if you take that so personally that it throws you off your game, business is going to be a really hard game 
for you to play. Number two, though, how can you look at a pissed off customer and say, what can I learn from this? How can you take extreme ownership even when and I get the whole like the customer's always right or whatever type of thing. But like, how can you take extreme ownership even when you don't even feel like it is actually your fault? How can you look at it and say, what can I learn from this? Right. Maybe I could have set up better expectations. Maybe I should have never brought that client in. Maybe I was desperately just trying to make money selling everyone. They weren't the right fit. Maybe. Right. And it's like, how can you assess and take extreme ownership? But then on the human and people side, and I don't think this gets talked about enough, this last piece. I believe in a philosophy. So my company's called Champion Development. We call it Champ Dev. Um, we believe in the concept called once a champion, always a champion. And what that concept means to us is do we treat class, uh, like clients and customers, do we treat them equally on the way out the door as we did on the way in the door, right? Like when someone's first signing up, you're like, you're telling them how awesome you are and you're get, but on the way out, out the door, sometimes it's like we're kicking them in the ass and like screw that person. And how can we make sure we uphold dignity and relationship when they have nothing to offer you anymore. Right. And I think that'll change the way people approach hard situations is like, how can I still uphold the dignity and the respect of this relationship? Like if they say, Hey, we want to switch gyms and we, or we're leaving. It's like, Oh, that's great. Um, uh, I'm glad you're able to get some results here. Like, tell me about yeah. those results and you know, Hey, maybe you can get like a testimonial on the way out, like, yeah. you know, and, and just be positive. Uh, whether no matter what, right? Because, yeah. you know, I, I talked about earlier, the obstacle is the way. I love that because that's like, yeah. it's the challenge. It's the obstacle is the unhappy customer, the unhappy member. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's key. Like, like, I love what you just said there, where how can they feel the same way going out as they, or you treat them the same way as they were coming in the going out? That's, yeah. That could be a principle right there, Michael. Like, like let's, totally. let's just take that. Yeah. <laughs> let's love yeah. it. And one, and one of the ways I sometimes see myself doing that is I'll thank them. Say, hey, I thank you for your honesty. Yeah. Or I appreciate the time that we did spend together as, you know, in a, in a working relationship. Or I hope to keep the door open one day to, to work together together one day. I never know when our, our paths might cross. Or, hey, what can I, like, there's so many different ways to approach that. But it starts first and foremost with knowing how to address your own individual emotions because if you're angry, if you're resentful, if you if, if, if a client leaves triggers fear of how am I going to pay the bills or I'm not good enough, that's when we start treating other people like crap when we're in our uh, most triggered states. It's interesting. My my son told me yesterday, hey, dad, I've, I've noticed you gotten less angry uh, very recently. I'm like – I'm like, really? Why? Why do? How do you? How do you know that? What are you? What are you looking at? And I'm like, well, I was looking at at you know the the hole that you patched up the you know <laughs> the wall, <laughs> and I don't yeah. see any more. I'm like, yeah. oh wow, that's great. Yeah. I'm, I didn't do such a good job <laughs> patching up a hole. <laughs> yeah, and it's nice. funny, right? Because it's a hole. If you do end up in you know in a bad way, it's a hole that can leave a lasting reflect you need to make sure you patch up that hole yeah. and and not let anybody else see it these these are gaps i'm just thinking about improvements and and yeah. gaps that you leave you know those bridges you, the burn bridge you, yeah. there was a bridge there look at that yeah totally. done totally. i love it no that's awesome that's awesome thank thanks for taking me back there and <laughs> and yeah. helping me be a little authentic with with my uh my story because it's it happens you know you get yeah. mad you're like oh yeah. oh man um michael this is this is awesome um so i i know that you said you never owned a uh you said real gym and but tradition, honestly a traditional I, gym. traditional right right traditional gym and I, I i look at that like the gym world is huge right there's there's so much sure. there's different functional gyms uh you know there's the boxing gyms there's martial art gyms, MMA gyms, yeah. all that stuff. But what do you see as, since you coach a lot of uh, trainers and, and, and gym owners as well, what is the biggest issue that you see in the fitness industry right now that you, that you say needs to be overcome so we can actually grow stronger? The biggest, well, two answers come to mind. 
in the online fitness space, I see a lot of people who don't actually believe they know how to help people mm -hmm. trying to make money because they can online, mm. right? And I hate that, right? I think that's crap, which is why anyone who ever works with us in our Passion to Profits program, where we teach personal trainers, nutritionists, health coaches, how to turn their passion for health and fitness into a six-figure profitable side gig or a full-fledged business, it's all by application. And one of the keys we look for is that you actually can help people, <laughs> right? Yeah. You actually care. So that's in the online world. In the in-person gym, I believe a lot of people who start gyms truly love health and fitness. They actually do know they can help people. And their love for fitness is their strength that fueled the initial part of the business. But they're oftentimes lacking in the understanding of marketing and sales. And I think if people want to build a great gym, that's a necessary skill. Now, I know most people listening to this would already obviously know that. Um, but sometimes when we care so much about helping people, we look at marketing and sales as this like, yeah, like I have to learn this. But what if we attach, what if we anchored learning how to get great in marketing and sales, not to money, but to the number of lives changed, transformed and impacted? Because most people who get into health and fitness businesses, they believe that they have something special. They believe that they're the best. They believe that they genuinely can help people. What if we could bottle that belief to serve others and fuel it into great marketing and sales, but not just to make more money? Because then marketing and sales feels like something we're doing to people. Mm -hmm. But what if marketing and sales was something we were doing with and for people, Ooh. right? And Tell learn us more, how to do it the right way. <laughs> that's, that, that almost seems like a, a book. <laughs> it, it, very, it very well could be. It very well could be. Well, how I mean, to do it, marketing and sales with people instead of to people. I love it. Yeah. Like, that's and great. for them, not to them, right? Well, right. it started with this. When I first got into my, my very first sales job, um, I remember I came home and told my family I was doing sales. And they stared at me like I was kind of crazy. Like sales in my world, in an Asian family, a bunch of educators, a couple doctors, like sales was viewed as a little bit like less than. Like you were the slimy, sleazy sales guy with a trench coat showing up yeah. to people's doorsteps like, hey, you want some of this? Hey, you want some of this? Uh -uh. And so one of the things that I really had to learn and understand is the mentality of winning in sales and winning in marketing in such a way that you're doing it with people and for people. And how I teach that uh, to some of our clients, one of the ways, there's many ways we teach it, but one of the ways I teach that is called the Harvard effect. Okay. And so the Harvard effect is this. A lot of times when we go into marketing and sales, we can come across as desperate. And that desperation energy can come across as needy. And that desperate, needy vibe in marketing and sales now feels like it's something we're doing to the customer, mm -hmm. not with them or for them. But if you picture Harvard, I'm assuming everybody's heard of Harvard before, right? Okay, so Harvard University. If you picture Harvard, I picture, let's just say, a multimillionaire mom. And she wants her son to go to Harvard. So she walks on to Harvard campus with her son, shows up to the admissions office and is like, I got millions of dollars. I'm a billionaire. I want my son to go to school here. I always joke, right? Unless that person has donated so much money or it's a corrupt admissions officer, the admissions officer is going to say, what? Has your son even filled out an application? Does your son want to go to school here? Right. Can we meet with your son, not you, ma'am, to make sure that your son's a good fit for us? So there's a little bit of like, we want you. This is a good phrase for people who are getting into marketing and sales. There's a, there's a, there's a balance of we want you, but we definitely don't need you. Right? We want you, but we don't need you. And it ends with this. I only want to work with the right person at the right time in the right situation. Mm. And that allows you to get clear Yes, on who your ideal client is, like who you want to serve, but it also allows you to get equally clear on who you don't serve. And that creates this like authority vibe where a lot of times in marketing, let's say we're marketing on social media, I might just include two to three additional bullet points 
and it changes the entire conversion of that post. And the two to three bullet points I might add might be, now quickly, this ad or this post is not for. So I'll say clearly who this is not for. I'll say this is not for you if you are fill in the blank, right? And it depends on what you're selling, of course. This is not for you if you need someone to baby you and handhold you along the way and losing weight. This is not for you if you are not 100% motivated to the goal yourself, because then I'm gonna have to convince you every week to take action. This is not for you if you're an excuse maker. However, if you are dot, 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 dot. So that's how I believe you market and sell with people mm. and for them is you're very upfront about who it's not for. So now you're not needy yeah. and you implement the Harvard effect and how you're going about marketing and sales. And I just want to just quickly wrap it up in, in like a couple of uh, words, like yeah. the qualification application, yeah. know who you serve best and don't do yourself a disservice by serving others outside of that. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's willing just, to say no. Yeah. Go say no. Like, Hey, we might not be a good fit. And, and I actually said that today to somebody and all right, I, I, the thing is, and this, I'm one of my team, team members, they're like, we're going to have a disservice to, to our product because they're not going to get the results that we're yeah. used to. And they're going to maybe have a bad word of mouth. So yeah. that's just not, not going to work for anyone. It's not yeah. a win-win. is a beautiful word to hear when you're scoring on the soccer field. This last World Cup was won by Argentina because of one important player. Yeah, you got it. It was the goalie. He secured the win for the team, and in the same way, ReviewBiz platform will catch negative reviews before they go online. In addition, it helps you score and promote fresh new reviews so you can crush the competition. So don't let those big box gyms take your clients. ReviewBiz will help you build your online presence and turn your own members into your best sales reps. Get your first five reviews for only $1. All you got to do is go to reviewbiz.io forward slash try to get started. If you look at most of the gyms that are thriving, like the big box brand, like brand name gyms. Right. If you look at most of them that are thriving, they're clear on who they don't serve and they're clear on who they do serve and they don't try and serve everybody. Right. That's right. Planet Fitness. Yeah. They, they, they <laughs> speak example. out, right? They speak out against the people they don't want to lift there. They went in and they removed what? They removed all the barbells, right? Uh, they removed all the squat racks. And they, they they even have, if you've ever been in a Planet Fitness before, I was traveling and I had to lift at one. There's something called, oh, what the heck is it called? Like a, cl uh, a clunk alarm or something yes, like that? Yes, yes, that's right. The 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 thump alarm or the clunk, I mean, something. If, if you drop your weights and you're grunting too hard, right, that's who doesn't belong here. Well, guess what? The person who lifts at Gold's Gym is going to go to Planet Fitness and be like, this is not my place, right? And then you have Equinox or right. a Lifetime, the price point that they price their gym at, right, is going to filter out a lot of your like, just I, I might be just trying to lose weight for the first time and I'm not a consistent gym goer, right? And so if you really look at successful gyms, they have done a really good job of getting clear on who they serve and who they don't serve and then building their business model around that. It's something like, don't quote me on the exact stat here, but like Planet Fitness has like 95% of customers that don't go to the gym more than once a year. But because they're $10 a month and they're targeting that type of person, they get tons of people to sign up and they're able to stay in business that way. So just Yeah, and there's no right or wrong. Way. It's like, hey, that's what's works for them. They're, they're successful in their, their own model and you got to find what works for you. That's it. Yeah. I agree. That's good. Yeah. That's a good, yeah. the, those are also Equinox and the Planet Fitness. And um, yeah, no, I, I, this, is, this is good. Um, yeah, I, I definitely think that the, um, you know, knowing your audience is definitely, and, and having an application and, and having like the certain onboarding, like let them fail fast. Hey, are you in or out? Like that first month, you got to figure out if that's the right fit for you. Right. And yeah. so, um, you know, that's a great practice. That's actually one of the questions I had for you is like, well, what's a good concept or practice, but that's basically embodies it right there. Yeah. Like that's like, you know, and I, 
that must be something you do in your own business as well. Like you have an yeah. online coaching business, and so you must have an application process. Well, do you fit this criteria? No, no. you don't. I'm sorry. You know, yeah. come back when you're ready. <laughs> yeah, totally. You know, and that's one other sub point to your original question, which is like, what is the biggest pitfall or mistake I see in gym with gym owners and business owners under the banner of marketing and sales is uh, knowing the critical metrics that actually lead to revenue. Right. I was coaching a gym owner um, who was doing OK. Right. They're making enough to like pay their bills, but they were definitely not thriving by any means. At the end of the day, he was taking home approximately 5K a month for himself. After working together for six months, uh, he was taking home 25K a month for himself. And one of the only things we worked on predominantly for that first three to six months was knowing three key like metrics within the sales funnel and process and how to influence them. Number one, of all the leads that he's getting, how many of them are actually getting converted to a scheduled appointment to stop by the gym mm -hmm. and then understanding what influences that like speed to lead right he was getting back to them days later sometimes and all things like that so we learned how to influence that then how to actually get them to show right because they would schedule but not show up how do we actually get them to show up at an 80 to 90 percent clip and then of the people that do show how do we convert and close them at a blank blank percentage and so we worked on just those three things for the first three to six months and his entire business changed we weren't generating a single extra lead i call it the maximization model how to maximize the leads you're already getting yeah. without having to generate more leads without having to spend a single extra dollar on ads most business owners are leaving five six and sometimes even seven figures in revenue uh, on the table by having what i would consider like a leaky boat right so. Oh yeah. yeah, I love it. I love. It. We call it leaky buckets over here. So leaky buckets, uh, yeah. boat buckets. Yeah. Oh, I love it. And and guys, if you find anything that Michael's talking about that you need to improve, like oh my gosh, yes, my speed to lead is horrible. My follow up is horrible. Getting them in. Just we're gonna have all his information in the show notes, uh, the, the down below. So make sure that you guys yeah. check the, him out, and and we'll we'll connect you with him. Okay, yeah. nice. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so one last question before we go into our rapid five cool. uh, questions is, yeah. uh, what is what was the thing that inhibited your growth? And, and what would you invest in that would help you gain that growth faster? Yeah, it's uh, like it's like a two part question. But it's like, sure. what, what would you like remove? And what would you invest in more about yeah. and and by the way and and this is something about about michael he's invested like two hundred thousand dollars in in one year and i remember reading uh in his his business mentor yeah. mentors and whatnot so so listen up guys like this is yeah. this is juicy over here yeah um one a and one b to answer your first question which was what has inhibited me one uh, a is alcohol so i grew up in a family of alcoholics i um I prided myself on being a frat boy uh, through high school and college. I was the world's greatest beer pong player and all these things, right? And I say that jokingly, but I, I drank, I drank. Um, four years ago, I gave up alcohol forever. And it's funny awesome. how this Congrats. current business has magnified and multiplied in relation to kind of the same time where I stopped drinking. And so I said 1A was alcohol, but do I know successful people who drink alcohol? Of course. Right. So it's not that alcohol in itself is the determining factor of success or not success. One B is alcohol for me was a crutch to doing really one most important thing. And that was learning how to master my own mindset and emotions. Right. Alcohol was an easy thing I went to when I was celebrating. So a happy emotion. But on the flip side, alcohol was something that I'd also go to when I was stressed. Right. Oh, man, it was a long week. Let's go get a drink. Alcohol is something I would go to if I was angry, like if I was in a fight with a significant other. It's like, I, I feel like we just need to stop. I just need to go get a drink. Like, screw this, right? So alcohol became a crutch I would go to instead of learning how to actually powerfully process and address my own emotions. And so that inhibited me for a while. And I made good money through most of my 20s and early 30s while I was drinking. But it's funny just how much more things multiplied quickly 
when I eliminated alcohol and started to actually be my best self. On top of the fact that like the number of hours that you feel like you get back, I'm the type of person if I drank heavily, I would sleep on Sundays to one, two, three, four o'clock sometimes, right? And so the hours that you get back, the focus that yeah. you get back, the energy that you have, um, that inhibited me for sure. On yeah. the other side of your question, uh, things that I would invest in, you mentioned the, the amount of money I've invested in different mentorship and coaching, but I would invest in more coaching sooner and more consistently. And what I mean by that is I think too many people strategy hop. I'm going to try this coach and I'm going to try that coach. That would be like, and I get to talk to gym owners here, so you would get this, right? That would be like if someone tried your weight loss program or your weight loss approach for 60 days and it's like, cool, I tried that for six days, I saw some results. I'm now gonna go try vegan and keto and walking and bar and right every 60 days. They might feel great, but we all know as gym owners that if we actually wanna transform our physique, a lot of times it's progressive overload, doing the same basic boring workout week in, week out right for 12 16 24 weeks in a row and following the same nutrition plan and so i would have invested in more coaching and mentorship earlier because my big ass ego got in the way of me investing in mentorship at a lot of different stages of my life like oh i can figure this out on my own uh and then i would sometimes get results when i would invest in coaching and then i would say now i don't need to invest anymore i can do it on my own and funny enough that's a lot of times when my business would keep growing and then plateau but my somatic therapist, for example, I've seen her every other week for the last. Can you pause right there? Five years straight. Yeah. Just right there, right? Is it what is a somatic therapist? I don't. You know, us over here, and I'm, I'm in the East Coast. <laughs> I don't know. It hasn't gone to us yet. Tell, tell us about yeah. it. So, um, I didn't know what it was. In, in, uh, you know, until about five years ago, either. In fact, I had a very negative stigma about therapy. Um, right. In okay. the sense of like, that means you're broken. That means something's wrong with you. Like my masculine achiever ego uh, would never even let myself go to therapy, nonetheless, somatic therapy. Yeah. But to answer your question, most traditional therapy, as we think of it, from my understanding, is what I would consider like talk therapy, where we talk our problems sure. out loud with a therapist. Somatic therapy gets you out of your head and into your like nervous system, into the emotions, into the body. Right, because if you think about it, one, our brain forgets all types of things, but our body remembers all types of trauma triggers. That's why we can be watching a movie, right? And all of a sudden something's making us cry because it reminds us of an emotion in a relationship. On the other side, we can have all the personal growth strategies in our mind, that was me, but then I'm stressed and I'm acting like an asshole. I'm drunk and I'm saying stupid shit. I'm, uh, I'm anxious and I'm like not being my best self. That's because our mind can't always outwork our actual nervous system and our emotional state. So somatic therapy is the healing of our nervous system and our emotions. Wow. Yeah. Almost, almost spiritual. Like it can, it can get spiritual yeah. at times. Yeah. Um, but the cool thing is, it's is great. that, even if someone's not spiritual or not religious in any way, shape or form, it, in my opinion, from my own experience, somatic therapy is the most transformational, um, like personal growth work that I think people can do if they want growth, fulfilled happiness, sustained joy, um, and things like that. So to answer that question. I love it. Thank you yeah. for that. And you were talking about your, she was saying your, your somatic therapist was saying, yeah, I was saying that I've now, so one of my keys to success, when I look back at the things I'm most proud of that I built, yeah. I stayed with that teacher, coach, mentor, et cetera, for extended periods of time, right? I had the same karate instructor from when I was three to today, right? 30 something years Wow. Uh, as an example, right? Or my very first business mentor, right? He's still a mentor of mine. I started with him in 2009-ish, right? So 10 to 15 years in some way, shape or form, he's been a mentor of mine. And so a lot of times when I feel like I haven't grown as quickly is when I was strategy and coach hopping uh, too often. So I would have, you, you said, what do I have invested in more? I would have invested in coaching and mentorship earlier, but also more, more consistently long-term. And, and I think that also can be a good strategy when 
you know, gym owners and the trainers are talking to their members, to their new clients. Hey, yeah. listen, how commit for six months. We actually had a, a gym owner here. It's like, they don't do anything less than six month training. Like oh. that's, that's it. And, and a lot of people are like, Whoa, that's crazy. No, well, that's, that's, that's actually smart. Six months. Yep. That's it. Like you, you're committed here. And six months or a year, right? So it's like that's those those are two different yeah. plans. That's it. My P, my health and wealth academy. We do six month entry level programs, and yep. then every program after that's 12, 18, or twenty four months. The go. karate school uh, that I started at. If you're in an intro program with like a four year old, you can do three months. But most entry level programs are six months. But uh, many yeah. times after that, you're in twelve and twenty four month commitments because yeah. you know there's there's a phrase that I, I think it's used a lot. I think Alex Ramosi being here in the gym world. Uh, has said it a lot, so it's kind of popularized it. But if I don't see myself doing something for a decade, don't consider it for a day. Wow. Right. And if people really want results at just about anything in life, business, health, etc., this is the fundamental philosophy of my own health and wealth academy. And that is, we only want to give you weight loss strategies that you could see yourself doing for a lifetime. I love it. Right. And so if you don't see yourself doing it for a decade, don't do it for a day. I, I love the, the value you're bringing. I, and, and thank you so much for sharing. And, sure. you know, I, I almost feel like this is like, I, I am so blessed because I get to, to ask the questions and, <laughs> sure, and, and sure. help you, uh, share your, your knowledge. And, and I almost feel like I, I get coached all these times that I, I yeah. do these, these podcasts. Um, That's amazing. and That's it great. resonates with, with me because what I'm doing and stuff, it all lines up. And so, so good. So are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. I think let's you, go. you called it the rapid five or something like that. Rapid five, we call it uh, uh, fast five, just fast five. So cool. So some people, I say fast five and some people slow it down. So it's up to you <laughs> if you want to slow it down, but cool. I'm going to give it to you fast. So ready? Sounds good. All right, here we go. So who is an influential person in your business journey or people? Yeah, um, I think one that everybody knows and then one that most people don't know. Uh, but one that everybody knows is Tony Robbins. He was the first introduction I really had to personal growth. Uh, I was watching a late night infomercial. So this dates when I was figuring it out. This is before paid ads, this is before social media and everything like that. I was watching a late night infomercial on TV and here's this fired up guy talking about breakthroughs and everything like that. And I whipped out my credit card at like midnight and I bought his entire CD series and I turned my car at the time. I took all six CDs out of the six CD changer. Uh -huh. And I put audiobooks from Tony Robbins in instead. And for the next three to five years straight, wow. anytime I was driving to anything work or business related, I did not listen to music. I right. only listened to, to that. So that's there. Um, and then like someone people probably wouldn't know, but has a major impact on my life uh, is a guy named Mike Cassetta. And he was one of the first mentors I had in my first business. He's gone on to create an incredible professional career uh, for himself, uh, executive roles at some really big companies like Square and Compass Realty and things like that. Uh, but I, I was blessed to learn so much from him at a young age. Mm. Um, and so that was the the other influence on my business career. Yeah, it sounds familiar, the last one. Um, I have yeah. friends in the Compass world. So yeah, that sounds cool. very familiar. Okay, yeah. cool. Thanks, man. Uh, so now the next one is, What's one thing you wish you had known when you began your business? It's probably a lot. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. Well, I've, I've built five um, different businesses. So each business is uh, a little unique. The simple answer is I wish I understood the challenges that come with each individual business and each individual level of growth. And at the same time, I don't think we grow if we were perfectly prepared for every challenge. So wow. uh, yeah. in one breath, I wish I knew about every challenge, but what I really wish I understood at every single business earlier was that every product, every business requires a little bit of a unique marketing and sales approach. I can always come back to the same principles. I can always come back to the same philosophies and fundamentals, but how I sold at this business is going to be slightly different, even if it's the sim same widget mm. at this business, right? And I wish I understood that you don't just copy and paste sales strategies from one business to the next. Oh, that's good. I like yeah. that, right? Because there's 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 people out there that have multiple businesses, uh, and they could probably attest to that for yeah. sure, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's great. 
Um, and you kind of touched this on, on this before a little bit, but but what's a, a book, a blog, a podcast, some media that you consume that positively has impacted your life? Yeah. Um, so many. <laughs> yeah. I think the habit is what has changed my life more. And then I'll, I'll mention a book itself. But the, there's a two part habit. One, I stopped listening to music when I was at the gym. I, I basically only turn music on when I'm doing like a big lift, like I'm about to squat or bench press or something like that. Some PR but, or something. Yeah, 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 exactly. But for the most part, I'm actually listening to audiobooks whenever I'm working out. Okay. Um, but the second thing that changed is I stopped caring about how many books I'm reading. Mm. And there's times where I will get through the same book 16 times before going on a new book. And here's how I do that. I basically will listen to two chapters audio and then I'll start them all back over again. And I'll only let myself move on to the next chapter or two when I'm getting to the point. This is the analogy I use for people who watch Sports Center. If you've ever been watching Sports Center before and you know it's time to go to bed because you're like, oh crap, they're playing the same highlight I saw an hour ago, <laughs> right? When I get to that point with a book yeah. where I know what story, what, what, what sentence, what he's get, what topic they're about to say again, to you the point where it. I could repeat it. I know it's time to move on, and so I don't yeah. take it as just like reading books, but studying books. And yeah, uh, but some of the most impactful books for me, uh, Think and Grow Rich, yeah, on the mindset side of building business, Twenty One Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John Maxwell and leading an organization, uh, the book Scaling Up on the Operations of a Business, Delivering Happiness uh, by Tony Shea on how to infuse culture. Uh, into uh, into a business. And the last one I'd say for now, although I could list many, is The Happiness Advantage by Sean Aker. Uh, and that is, does success lead to happiness or do happy people create success? Hmm. And if happy people create success, how do we create happiness within ourselves? And so it's a really, really, really cool book. Yeah. Happiness is, is a big topic for sure. Yeah. And, yeah. and those are great books you just mentioned. And, and and we'll, we'll list them out again. Th those, those are fantastic. Thanks for sharing yeah. that. And, pleasure. you know, always finding out the source of, of knowledge. Right. Um, and this one, I have two more. So yep. do you have a favorite online tool? A favorite online tool. I mean, my business lives in Slack at this point, right. As far as like communication, uh, and everything, uh, everything like that. But I think my favorite is Voxer or any type of like voice noting tool. Yeah, that allows you to to communicate via voice, mm -hmm. but speed up or transcribe it. So like in Slack, you yeah. send voice notes, but then there's a tool that transcribes the whole voice note for you. I yeah. think that's amazing, right? Voxer, why I love that is it allows you to speed up voice notes, not just to two X speeds, which is what most products do. Voxer allows you to take it up to four X speeds. <laughs> And so I can get through a four minute voice note in a minute. I can get through a one minute voice note in you know 20 ish seconds or whatever. And so um, I think those, those tools are my favorite, at least in my current business right now. Yeah. Voxer is great. I got yeah. introduced to the Voxer in, like two years ago and it's yeah. uh, and you can, add, you can do it on your computer too, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, no, that's uh, and I, I think recently a lot of people are talking about the chat GPT. Have you tried that one? I I can't say it's my favorite tool yet because I've only been using it for, three weeks or hundred percent. Well, yeah. It's not, um, you haven't vetted it. And, and now it's actually been every last three times I've I logged in down. The servers are down and everything like that. Well, well, will it end up being most people's favorite tool? Probably. I think so. Is it my, is it my favorite tool yet? No, 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 no. I don't use it enough to, to, to get it. Correct. Uh, become that favorite. Yeah. hundred percent. And then the last one is what's one habit or practice you do that you believe everyone should do and would benefit from. Yeah. Um, gratitude and some version of self-talk. Mm. Um, I'm not a believer that you need to have an extended morning routine to change your life. I am a believer that we need to inspect what we expect mm. of the world. Love that. Yeah. And what we expect is normally a byproduct of what our, like our subconscious voice or what our self-talk is saying to ourselves. And so I'll kind of start to close out with this. And it was like five, six years ago, um, I was at what I call the dark season of my life. Mm -hmm. I had made all this money in my 20s and I lost a lot of it through investments and trying new businesses and 
uh, everything like that. So I had a lot of shame around that. I was on the verge of divorce. I felt myself stuck in this small town in New Jersey that I didn't really believe I was happy in, but I was staying out of obligation because I was supposed to stay close to family. And so I had all these things that were kind of like the dark season uh, of my life. Who I am today, I, 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 I steal Tony Robbins' line and he says, I reinvented this mofo. Right. And what he's referring to or what I'm referring to is about five ish years ago, four years ago, I started this new morning and evening routine. It's probably five to 10 minutes. I call it my power shower. Like I could say the whole thing while I'm showering. It's so short. So it's not like I need hours and hours, but it's a combination of gratitude and self-talk. Right. Where right. I basically focus on things I'm grateful for from the day before or the week and then self-talk about what I'm committed to creating, and most mm. importantly, who I'm committed to being so I can continue to level up my identity. And so I think some version of a habit that uh, levels up people's self-talk is a life changer. I love that. And it actually connects with my five-minute five journal. Yeah. It's like the three things, of gratitude and affirmations yeah. and stuff in the morning and at night. Well, well, went well, no, I love it. That's awesome. I, I, I'm with you. That's, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Everybody should do some form of that <laughs> for sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, and then the last question, um, that we just kind of like wrap up and, 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 uh, say our goodbyes, but you know, so sad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if you could go back in time and share one piece of advice with 10 year old Michael, what would that be? What advice would I uh, give? Number one, it's okay. Like learning to address emotions is strength. Mm. You know, growing up, like I said, Asian background, uh, martial arts background, it's like stop crying, be tough and all those things. Um, but I think the ability to know how to manage and process our own emotions is strength, is a superpower is probably the most personal advice I would give. And then on the business advice, I would say work ethic is not the only key to wealth. There are tons of people that work wow. hard. There yeah. are tons of people that work hard. But what vehicle you're in and who you're surrounding yourself with is oftentimes a bigger determining factor of success than just work ethic, right? Because some people are in a vehicle that's a billion dollar cap. Some people are in a vehicle that you can only make a hundred grand. That person's oftentimes working less than this person, but yet that person can only make a hundred grand. And then the people we're surrounded ourselves with, most of the wealth I've created over the last even just five years, when I reflect back, is a byproduct of not knowledge, but some sort of relationship that I've developed, whether it's an investment deal I've gotten into, a coach I've been introduced to, a strategy that I've implemented has been a byproduct of who, not just how. So. Those would be kind of the personal and business advice that I would give 10 year old me. I love that. I love that 10 year old. You would be, uh, just be like, what? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Invest in, in people yeah. and emotion. Oh, dude. Love it. Love it. Yeah. That's so good, man. Well, Michael, man, it's been such a pleasure to have you on this podcast show, uh, Jim owners growth zone. And thank you for sharing your wealth of knowledge for, for being who you are and helping us get into that growth zone. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. thank you so much, man. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hey, that was so good. Michael definitely jam-packed the interview with some good nuggets. I really like the simple two A's. It's a focus formula for success, which instead of focusing on the outcome, you focus on the attitude and activity. And you know I truly love talking about not taking feedback personally and learning from it. How about the idea that sales and marketing can be done with people and for people instead of to people? I hope you understand that concept. So I would love to hear what stood out for you. So go ahead and drop me a comment on Instagram. You can find me at Meet Esco, and I'd be super grateful to hear from you. Also, if you need to do so and you thought about somebody while listening, go ahead and share this podcast with them. Thank you again for your time and attention and listening to our show. And remember to follow or subscribe if you still need to do so. Our next episode is going to be with David Gangland. 
and I can't wait to have you listen to our conversation. It's going to be about marketing, so very timely. So I'll be seeing you next time in the Grow Zone.